Hey there, everybody. It's Corey with The Abundant Artist. Uh, I'm super excited because today uh, I, I, I'm, I've got Jesse Reno on. And before Jesse says hi and we dive into stuff, I have to sell like this short story. I was um, so my wife and I just moved over to the east side of Portland and uh, I'm getting to know the neighborhood and stuff. And I was walking around a few weeks ago and uh, I walked by this uh, art studio. And it's like super, you know, it's very much like an art studio. It doesn't look like a like a gallery or a museum or whatever. It's like definitely there's a working artist that he, that that works here. And so I pop in and I look around and I read this guy's bio. And this guy's the bio basically says, uh, "I'm a working artist. I make a living from my work. I've been doing it for 12 years. Uh, I've sold thousands of pieces of art, and uh, and I love what I do." And I was like. Oh my gosh! Like nobody writes about their art this way. This is so great. Like it's really, really refreshing. And so, I had to figure out who this artist was. So I went into the studio, and um, he wasn't there. So I just walked around and looked at looked at stuff a little bit. And then I looked him up online, and I was like, okay, I got to get this guy on the podcast to talk about him, um, talk about his work. So Jesse Reno, say hi to everybody. I'm super excited you're here. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Thanks for having me on. Super stoked to be here. Yeah, awesome. So Jesse. Um, <laughs> When I mentioned, like, I, I took an Instagram of your bio and mm -hmm. uh, shared it, and um, a couple of friends were like, "Oh man, you got to get Jesse on the podcast." Like, Flora Boli was like, "You definitely like Jesse's awesome." Um, and several other people were like, "Dude, you got to get him on." So <laughs> I'm excited you're here. Yeah, um, like you you paint so intuitively, and and I love like I, I watched I went way down a rabbit hole of watching YouTube videos of you painting and other people like, and you talking at workshops and stuff. And it seems like you live most of your life that way, just pretty intuitively. Is that, is that a fair assessment? Yeah, it's weird. I was thinking about that question and uh, yeah, not quite like the paintings. I mean, I make plans. I try to follow them. I try to use logic in there, but definitely go with my gut still let that kind of prevail. If something doesn't feel right, I'll kind of choose it or not choose it based on that mm -hmm. more than, more than, economics or what seems like it might, might work because you never know i mean everything's 50 50 anyway or 75 25 or something so i'd rather i don't know when i do things because i want to do them and they don't work i could care less you know in a good way like i'm not like mad about it but if i make a decision based on oh, this should work and this should be something great and it doesn't work i find myself to get really irritated and notice that early on in the career so kind of learn to just trust my gut Right. But yeah, I flow pretty easy now. I mean, I've been full time long enough that I can kind of do that. I've built it up that way. Kind of decided that was the most important thing is having freedom, so that you're making the choices you want to, rather than, you know, chasing things or just taking everything. You're trying to throw some kind of logic in there. I mostly take everything anyway because you never know. Every <laughs> the smallest thing can turn into the biggest thing, and likewise in reverse. So. Yeah, it seems like you uh, hustle really hard. Like you, you're you're working a lot. Yeah, for sure. I mean, especially in the beginning. I mean, I had like serious rules to get me here where it was like you had a full time job and it was like, all right, 10 hours a week, either trying to get a gig or making contacts or make 10 contacts, whichever one comes first, then you're off the hook and you can paint because it's one thing to paint. It's another thing to make a living from. Oh, so that's interesting. So you so you had a rule for yourself that you had to do like business stuff and marketing and sales first. Yeah, and make I had contacts and then you could paint. Yeah, because my thought was if one in 10 of those works, well, you know, better to make 10 and hopefully one works out and kind of built up out of that. Did like quick math. I was like, all right, 52 weeks in a year, that's 52 contacts. Contact 500 people, something should happen. <laughs> <laughs> and fair enough, you know, and now it's just, it's pretty much, I stayed on like literally the same, that level of hustle for probably the first four years. And then things started to happen that I didn't really need to make. 10 calls. It was like calls were coming in and I was just kind of navigating them and saying, well, navigating them pretty much said, yes, 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 yes. For another five <laughs> years. But now it's like, okay, what am I, what do I want to do? So the new, the new channel has been like breaking the habit. <laughs> do you have, um, by the way, we've lost your video. Um, I don't know if you oh. muted it. Yeah. No, I don't know. Uh, where? So if you mouse over the, uh, your own face, uh -huh. um, or, you, or your avatar, there should be a little menu that drops down that has a video and a microphone. Nope. <laughs> no. 
back on. So that's weird. Uh, I, other people in the chat are saying that they can see your video, so huh. I'll just trust that that's working. Cool. All right. Sorry. Um, no, that's that's it's, it's all good. So so you went through this process of you know trying to make trying to hustle and make phone calls and then saying yes to everything for a while and now you sort of say no to some stuff. Do you have criteria for what you say no to? Uh, basically, it's like how fun is it going to be? Is a big part of that. Um, and you know, it, it's a combination of probably fun, economics, location. If it's travel based. Mm -hmm. Just because it all got ahead of me. I mean, it was like all fun in the beginning to do everything, travel everywhere, and then you get to a point where you're like, whoa, there's only so many months in the year. I only have so much energy, and all the travel mm -hmm. takes away from creativity and fun. And for years, I like I had fun doing the whole thing, but it was like my music got shelved, a whole bunch of other side projects. It was just like focus and, and chase. So now I just break it down to like how many people am I going to connect with on this event or workshop or lecture whatever whatever it is mural anything where is it i mean murals painting big exhibitions take priority um you know just kind of where's it gonna get me i kind of ask the basic questions of how 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 good does this seem cool so for you like your art business looks like making mm -hmm. murals making original paintings i noticed that you also uh you have like a shop online where you sell some prints and some other stuff uh, I think you had. A, I think I saw that you had uh, painted a skateboard. Yeah, I do a little bit of commission or licensing work. Uh, not too much if it hits me and it's something that I really like and agree with. I'll go ahead and do it. But, uh, right. Oh, okay. So the the skateboard was is a license deal. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's a friend that run like the old skate shop in Portland. It's one of my friends, so that was a no brainer. Um, I've done like a handful of stuff: some skis, some shirts, you know, uh, some other decks back in the past. But it's not something that I chase. I'm more like if that shows up and it sounds like a good deal, then I'll then I'll go ahead with it. Right. On. Just because you find that m more than not, you know, that, that just lends to more questions, more specificity, and I'm kind of, I'd rather just do it on another and then do another project that's going to take the same energy and frustrate me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so so the and and when you say frustrate you, what does that mean? Uh, that could mean any number of things. That could mean somebody telling you you're free to do what you want and then telling you what to do in the end or telling you more like this, more like this. It's like I'm not a really good more like this guy because I'm trying to do things from my gut. It's like I don't know what I'm going to paint. So tell me to paint even something you've seen me paint 20 times like a horse. Once you tell me to paint a horse, it's like you curse the whole thing and you're probably going to get a squid. <laughs> so I know better to just stay out of it. I mean, I can do it, but I can't tell when it's honestly awesome and done. It, it might be, but it feels tried so that it doesn't feel real. Having your gut be the sole teller of what's really real and feeling it and looking at it and going, wow, this is awesome. I didn't expect this. Well, if you tell me to expect it, you kind of cut the equation down and that's just, that makes me kind of nuts. <laughs> so for those who don't know, um, who have not gone down the YouTube rabbit hole watching your work, uh, on your website you describe your work as contemporary, primitive, abstract narrative, mm -hmm. um, and you you paint intuitively. And uh, right. I, I just you know to understand Jesse's process, I would encourage you you know after this after you watch this interview or listen to this interview, go to YouTube and watch uh, some of Jesse painting, or go watch like people talking about his work. So it's, it's really interesting to watch you paint um, right and hear you talk about your work. So um, you talk about living with mistakes and in, in your painting, what does that mean? Uh, I don't, well, to me, I don't, I don't know. It's weird. I'm trying to think where that like exactly came from. I mean, I make mistakes. I, I, I feel that it's better to make mistakes and fix them and not, so I don't even really count them as mistakes at the time. And sometimes a mistake, turns into something awesome, so that one almost doesn't count. <laughs> it's like I pretty much f fight with them, battle with the paintings, do whatever I need to do to get it to a point where I'm fixing mistakes constantly. I'm making them and fixing them or going with them when I realize they haven't been a mistake. So that process is kind of like I work on a lot of stuff at once, jump around between pieces so that I have a clear head because it's easy to think just because things didn't go the way you want, they're a mistake, but I don't really think that's a good way to look at things when you're seeing it with a fresh head just because you intend one thing to happen and something else happens like if i go 
to mess on vacation and get a gig is that a mistake <laughs> no you know what i mean so no, you're supposed to be on vacation no getting gigs while you're on vacation right and sometimes it is a mistake you should be on vacation but like things like that can happen and, and same within a piece you know you're going in one direction you get frustrated you paint over a bunch of it that leads to some new whole idea concept and something that really seems purposeful then again it's it's not really a mistake it's just some step in getting there so i kind of put them i, I kind of like to refer to everything as an instance yeah more than you know um and then and i mean in life i i don't know same thing i i feel like mistakes you choose what you choose because you're choosing it so you're still going to learn something from the mistakes as well you know i've i've made i guess mistakes but they fall out me other things so i feel like that's where i get a lot of my knowledge it's where i'm not the smartest guy but when something happens i see it and i can make a sense of it it sounds like you just have a natural tendency to work really hard and learn quickly. Yeah, yeah, I pay attention. That's what I'm saying. Like, I'm not the smartest guy, but I'm definitely paying attention. If I see an idea, I follow it. Um, things that happen on mistake, like a great mistake I made early on and, and related to business. Well, it wasn't a mistake at all, but um, I, was I was doing like lower level shows, coffee shops, uh, hallways to industrial buildings, just showing my work wherever I could at the time. And nobody was making cards or promotional materials. So then I thought, oh, I'll make my own promotional materials. I was like, well, there's five gigs coming up for the next 30 months. Maybe everybody will give me 20 bucks. So I hit up all the places I was shown at, said, hey, I'm making this card. Would you throw in $20? I'll put your information on there. Everybody gave me the money. I paid for the cards. And all of a sudden, when I was handing out the cards, nobody thought, oh, you're a cheapskate. You put five cards on one. Everybody's like, whoa, you got a full schedule. Look at all the stuff you're going. Look at everywhere you're showing. So after that, what do you think? Every card I made was like that. I didn't make individual cards or promotion. I just put everything I was doing on everything. Uh -huh. And it seemed to really, you know, activate people and respond. So that's so clever. So to pay for the printing of the cards, you had all the places you were showing pay you 20 bucks. Yeah, I asked them. And if they wouldn't have done it, I would have done it anyway. But, you know, yeah. I figured they don't want to put out $100, but I bet you'll put out 20 I mean, who wouldn't give you 20 bucks? You're doing a show with them, you're doing, you know, and then, like I said, the card, the best part was just that everything was on there and the way people responded to it, it was so much stronger. I'd given them cards before, like, hey, I'm showing here. And they're like, oh, cool. When he gave them one of five places, it was like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you you mentioned on your website that you've been in over 100 galleries. Is that is that like art galleries and coffee shops and like every other every place you've shown, or is that just ga art galleries specifically? No, that's a collection of everywhere I've shown, but mm -hmm. I'd say at least, well, let's figure, yeah, probably half of that or more than half of that's been galleries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you if you Google Jesse, uh, everyone listening, you'll find uh, a whole bunch of online galleries that are showing Jesse's work, and you can read interviews and stuff they've done with him in in those places and what they've written about him. Um, but how in the world, like, did you nab that many galleries? Like, are you, you know, how long did you continue doing the? Or rather, I know you said you were doing ten calls a week, but how did that those those fifty plus galleries come about? Uh, pretty much like that, as well as one leads to another. Somebody sees you show in some place, almost everything leads to something else. Even if it's a coffee shop, you could have your show in the coffee shop and then somebody who runs another space sees it and asks you in, uh, group shows, other friends asking you in, that starts to cross up a lot. But, uh, I, mainly just going for it. Most of it's things I just hunted them. And I mean, when you break it down, it sounds crazy, but 50 divided by five is only 10. That's 10 yeah. shows a year, you know, yeah. and that's kind of what I did for the first eight years or something, you know, sometimes even more than 12 shows, foreign ones, uh, national ones, or, or wherever it's done the work. So, you know, you're not necessarily, just, you're, if you're participating in every show, you're not necessarily there in face for every song or more send outs, mailing the work. Um, but yeah, just, just hunting them and then what that leads to on its own. Nice. So, that's a lot of shows. Mm -hmm. That's that's a lot of activity. <laughs> yeah, how, totally. how do you do that many shows? Like, how do you physically prepare to do that many shows? Uh, well, I mean, I work all the time. I mean, for the first, again, like up to, oh, let's say, just say up to like three years ago, I mean, I was making like 
two, 300 paintings a year. I mean, I paint every day. It's all I really want to do. It's kind of for a while, it was like all I knew how to do. I'd go try and take vacation and then I would just sit on the beach for two hours and then go paint. Um, so that's a big part of it. I mean, I always have work on, on hand, ready to go. Uh, I was pretty smart when I got to a point, let's like around 2007 or so, I had a big show in LA. I, I got ahead, made really good money, sold a bunch of paintings, made a bunch of money at that show. My immediate thing that I learned there was I watched them and what they were doing. And I was like, oh, they have an assistant. He hangs stuff, he frames stuff, he glues stuff, he boxes. I was like, you know what? This much money goes to a bigger studio. This much money goes to an assistant. I get zero of that. Keep hustling and uh, hired an assistant back then. So I've had an assistant for the last 10 years who does anything from boxing to framing to running stuff to the post office, updating my website, photographing my work, sizing images, all, all, all the tedious stuff that you don't really want to do. You find somebody who's like your best buddy who can do it and you're, you're happy to hang out with for 10 hours a week or so, anywhere from like 10 to 20, depending on how busy we are. If we're slow, we, we pretend that we're working for 10 hours and we work for five. <laughs> you know, but, I mean, that's the other part of it. You, you yeah. can only do so much. That's what I started to realize. I was like, whoa, I'm getting like, not necessarily burned out, but I'm getting run like a dog here to do all these jobs. You know, it's way it's super effective and way worth it because even 10 hours of work, we all know, I'm sure you know, if you don't want to do something, that 10 turns into 20 real quick because you mm -hmm. go, I'm going to get a coffee before I do that. I'm going to walk the dog. I'm going to walk in a circle. I'm going to do six <laughs> other things. You know? So yeah, it's about like doing the work and not making excuses to do other stuff before you do the work. Yeah. And then when you get to a point where you can afford it, find somebody else to do the stuff you want to make excuses about and become a director. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So the person who is your studio assistant, are they, is that person an artist or is it just like, they're just have a completely different skill set and this is what um, they do for you? In the, let's see, I've had three different guys. My first guy, they've all like dabbled, been like drawers or something, but they weren't necessarily artists. They weren't like trying to be an artist. Um, two of them now that they've worked after they worked for me for a long time, kind of, kind of went more in that direction, had some shows, um, mm -hmm. my current assistant, he, he's working on, um, he's like 50, 50, his career, maybe more like living off art and then odd jobs and working for me. Um, but mainly, mainly what I look for is somebody that I can get on with. And that's not, not to say stupid, but not stupid. Like, I feel like if you've got somebody who's smart, whether they know what you're doing, whether they know these jobs, if they're good at kind of getting on, and you can work with them, they'll, they'll learn the job. I mean, it's not that hard. My first assistant was way into computer stuff, so that was a plus. Did a lot of uh, inventory, back inventory, created like a killer website in the back end for me, regardless of what it looks like in the front. So that was kind of- I was gonna big. ask, like yeah. your, so all of your pieces on your website have an inventory number on them, yeah. which is super helpful because you're so prolific, right? 4,000 plus pieces. Sure. Um, so, you know, if they all have an inventory number, when somebody inquires, they can say, I am looking for this number, right? Reason two, so one, how right? does that, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> um, what does that look like on the back end? If somebody says, I'm looking for piece number 1005. Right, so basically on the back end, what I can do is log into a section that allows me to search by item number, to whatever number you just said, title size price like say you didn't know the number you gave me the title and maybe there's three of them that are <laughs> something with a unicorn and i'm looking i could go i could be like okay so it's this big or it's this price type that in and that in and it'll bring it right up so i'm able to search by any criteria that i've divided the painting into like that i've set as a criteria mm -hmm. uh, and then as well as that like for my own inventory and keeping track of uh I can organize them. There's like a whole back end section, which is like things that are in the studio that are on the website, things that have been sold, things that are at galleries. Each gallery has got a name and an inventory next to it. that I can search real quick if I'm like, what do they have still? Or did they, oh, somebody asked about this painting on the website, but it's, oh, it's in Puerto Rico or it's in where, wherever it is at a gallery. So I can keep track that way and I can mark them sold that way. Yeah, and basically it's a database. Yeah, it's awesome. a user database in the back end. Yeah. And that that's was so, my first that's assistant. super useful. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, so I love the fact that you're so like intuitive and flexible 
in the studio and on your business side, like you've really got it together. Like you're organized, you know what you're trying to do, you're thoughtful about it. Um, do you have any habits or things that you do that allow you to, to shift between those two different ways of working? No, that part gets kind of janky sometimes. It all depends how active, like I'm pretty good at like do work first, get it done, or if something's bothering you, get it done so you can just peacefully paint and do your stuff. Uh, at times it gets, gets jambled up or like, you know, you're in the middle of a great session and you get an email about somebody wanting to buy a giant painting that can throw your whole day off. It sounds great, but you're like, oh, this is going to happen. This is gonna happen. What do they want? You check an email every five minutes, but they're like a normal person who checks email once a day and you've checked 30 times and you're like, why did they respond? And so it can, can be a little janky. I, 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 you know, that's kind of like my one thing that I'm still kind of working out. I got it down pretty good, but then I'm extreme in the other direction. So then I just don't check for days. I'm like, this is work time. And it's not bad. I mean, I don't no, nothing gets ruined in that way. I don't blow up things that are important. Um, I, for, I've done different things to try and navigate it. I've tried to like make work day, email day with my assistant. Like if it's non-essential, I let it wait till a couple days till work shows up again. And let him answer it so I don't get too activated. Um, but yeah, it's just kind of jumping back and forth. And, I, and I'm kind of like that anyway. So it kind of does work. Like I kind of like sometimes I don't even go to the studio. I'll work at home where it's like do some cleaning, do some painting, do some email, go back. Mm -hmm. You know, inevitably when you're painting, you get to points where you're just stuck or you're burned out. You're not even stuck. You just gave all the creative energy you have to this 10 paintings. What do you do now? Well, I'll go check email now. That'll take about an hour, you know, and then try and do something that erases it afterwards, like eat lunch or skate the dog or whatever it's going to be to kind of did reset. You say, did you say skate the dog? Yeah, the dog pulls me and I stand there and, and the dog is much better. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. What kind yeah. of dog do you have? What, what's your dog's uh, name? Two. I got like an 80 pound mutt named Buddy who's like going on 16. He skated pretty hardcore till he was 14. And now uh, another little 40 pound named Froggy, who's like got way too much energy, who still pulls me dead weight up a hill. So yeah, pretty similar. They're both mine. The 40 pound dog that pulls you up a hill on a skateboard. It's, That's awesome. it's madness. Like her front legs aren't even on the ground in the beginning. <laughs> she like jumps <laughs> off. It, yeah, pretty fun. There's little safety issues here and there, but overall. <laughs> That's great. That's great. So you've got deep roots in Portland. Did you grow up here? Uh, no, I've been here for like 13 years, 14 years, mm -hmm. some, somewhere right in there, 2003, 2004, right, right in that cusp. Where, where did you grow up? Uh, like till I was like a early teenager in New Jersey and then rural Pennsylvania, which was kind of rough. That was like the next, it's kind of like 13 years everywhere ish. Uh -huh. Why was like, rural Pennsylvania rough? Well, imagine if you came from like something equivalent to like Southeast Portland, you're hanging out, you're like five blocks from a whole bunch of commercial stuff, places to skateboard, places to do whatever. And then you moved into the middle of the woods and you look like this and the woods people didn't really like it. <laughs> so that was like the next bunch of years. Yep. Yeah. yeah, that's, that's interesting. I was just in, I was just in Raleigh, North Carolina and, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I run around in a hoodie everywhere here mm -hmm. in Portland. And in right. Raleigh, everybody's like dressed. So mm -hmm. I looked like a bum in Raleigh. It was pretty fun. Right, right, right. Yeah, that happens to me too. <laughs> so, so you sell not only through the galleries that you show through, but you also sell through your own website. Um, mm -hmm. you know, how do you navigate that? Like, like some galleries don't want artists to sell on their own. So how do you navigate that? Right, yeah, sometimes it's annoying. I'm not gonna say tricky. I mean, it's pretty cut and dry. They don't want you to show anywhere else but the gallery. Um, I mean, I'm sure that's stood in my way with some galleries or some people just haven't even hit me up because that's not in their mechanism or their ideas. I mean, the pricing's consistent from my gallery to my website to their gallery, whether I'm getting commission cut into it or not, the price is the same. So I don't really, for me, I just don't see the difference. It's like, you know, and if they're all different paintings, I mean, yeah, there might be some commonalities, but go look through there. Tell me that there's one that's the same. So you're selling individual project product. Everything's one of a kind. Why should there be a problem if they cost the same consistently based on size? 
because that's the only thing that's common. If we've got two two by twos, why are they different sizes or different prices? That might be a question I could wonder about. But beyond that, and again, early on, uh, when I was hustling and, and wasn't this successful and was doing it all and didn't have an assistant, I mean, I ran into that with the others, but I just have a conversation and say exactly that to them. And what I noticed early on was in a handful of cases, well, one would argue, and then you'd say, well, then don't show my work. And they say, but it's great. And you'd say, well, then why don't you show it and just deal with it? I mean, you're a gallery in another state. And I, I, the other thing is, like, yeah, some collectors will go to the sites and go search it out. But I'll tell you, dude, like, in experience of all, you know, the 100 galleries or 100 places in 13 years, there's, like, people who just see what they see, grab it when they get it. There's somebody who's looking for the cheapest price they can get it. And there's people that just go to galleries that don't go online. I mean, there's so many in-betweens that I don't think there really needs to be that conflict, whether whether they think it does or not. I think there's just rules that people make. But I, I've had very little cross where somebody went to a gallery, got a piece, and, and same thing there. I tell them, well, guess what, dude? If I know it's your collector, I'll give you your cut anyway. <laughs> if you've got a collector. The galleries that you work with are usually okay with that? Uh well, I'm offering them their share, whether they make the sale or not, if it goes to my gallery. And they'll still some, some of them are still difficult about it, at which point I say to myself, well, maybe I don't want to work with you. Either we work this out or, or what. I mean, I've had no gallery that's supported my whole career. I mean, I've been living for 13 years. There's nobody that made me a year's worth of money. There's like a couple galleries that made me like a bunch of months worth of money. But again, what, what am I supposed to do when that runs out? It, my backbone has been my own career and my own hustle and I've already the, the, you know by the time that was even happening I was making a living for four years five mm -hmm. years six years so unless you can prove to me that you're going to make me the same level of living or better I'm a fool to quit my job and give it to you you know right so it, it gets you know like I said I'm, I'm sure I've cut off some opportunities but overall I don't know I'm I'm waking up what I want, painting what I want, making choices. I'm making, I'm weeding through choices. So I guess it's all going okay. It gets, it gets internally conflicting at times for sure, dude. And I question what have I done or should have I done that? But then you look and you're like, I don't know, you know, and if you give it all up to somebody, you got to look at the other side of that. Well, who are they and what are they going to do? And I have an example that it was somebody who did great work for me. I loved working with them. They did nothing wrong. They were like, that's, they did everything right. Taught me so much. And, you know, into that conflict at the end of our showing, and we're like, I don't know if I can deal with you having the, the way you work. You just have too much work and you work too much and we want, you know, kind of like ownership of your work huh. so that we don't have competition. And I was like, well, you know, I'm going to keep doing what I do. I don't want to go back to a day job and whatever that kind of fizzled for a while. And then about a year and a half later, they were like, you know what, dude, we're going to open this space and we want you to be the crown jewel, like the grand opening show. So I put all this work aside for them, gave them all this priority. And then they're like, you know, like two months before the show was supposed to happen, they're like, oh, well, the economy kind of crapped the bed. Like, in the gallery and we're moving to the woods so what i'm saying there is you've got no guarantees from them mm -hmm. but yet you're supposed to give all these guarantees and you're supposed to jump through hoops and what you're going to do for them it's like i don't know i just ask the same questions well, what do you usually sell work for who are your clients what are you doing for promo and even with all that you just don't know you know so i i don't know to me i'd rather have my hand in 20 pots because if one boils over you got 19 left if I give it all to one person and let them have control and I start sitting easy, forget what I'm doing, get lazy, what happens if they move <laughs> and close their gallery? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They're, they're not giving you like a severance pay. <laughs> There's no unemployment to get to collect. There's just yeah. you with no money and no job now. So, Yeah, man. Um, I hear that a lot from veteran artists who've been selling you know in galleries for hundreds of thousands of dollars and then the gallery goes away for whatever reason so right. I, I certainly appreciate where you're coming from um so we're talking with jesse reno a uh, portland-based artist uh, a couple people asking you know ask me to say your last name again uh, over on the live chat uh and rachel lane says where the hell do you store all your work 
in my giant studio in the back room that you couldn't see through the window. <laughs> <laughs> it's all back there. There's probably about 300 paintings at the studio. They're all just stacked like a crazy Jimma Jam room. You can come see. <laughs> cool, cool. Uh, so I'll also say that like uh, Rachel, like not only is he, st you know, he's storing a few hundred pieces in his studio, but he sold, you know, thousands of pieces. So if you're worried about inventory and having too much work, like go sell it. Yeah, totally. I mean, you know, you, you kind of said the dynamics without saying them in line. This was another thing I came into uh, with a gallery. It was, it was just funny. It, I, did, I never did this math until somebody questioned me. They're like, well, dude, it says on your, on your thing that you made 3,000 paintings. Like, how am I as a gallery supposed to deal with that? And, and I was like, well, I only have 300. They're like, oh, only 300. So you have 300 paintings. And I was like, well, dude, did you do the math? That means I sold 90% of them. And then all of a sudden they looked at me like I was crazy. I was like, well, it's basic math. You can't, <laughs> I was like, yeah, I don't know how that answered their question, but it kind of put it in a perspective where it's like, well, again, I'm supposed to give you control and you're supposed to be in charge of me, but I still, or collect somehow <laughs> between me and other galleries before you, mm -hmm. we reached this number. So yeah, and I mean, if you're having too many paintings, maybe the prices are too high or maybe at that point, you should, you know, it all depends where you are in your career. I mean, I started out selling stuff as cheap as I could that people, that I was like, there's no reason not to buy it. I mean, I just did hard math right from the beginning, you know, and, and who are you? What did you, what did you do to earn this level of pricing? So let's, let's talk about pricing for a second. Cause I know that everybody mm -hmm. that's listening is going to be super curious about how you handle your pricing. I, I did a workshop over the weekend and uh, somebody asked about their pricing and we went on an hour long tangent talking about how to price your art. So, mm -hmm. uh, Sarah O'Connor points out that right now your look, your art looks like it's about $3 per square inch. Do you, do you price it that way intentionally or, or do you price it more intuitively? Uh, no, that became intentional over time. Deal with galleries, get into a bigger level. Enough people were like, this is how you should do it. This is the way it's done. And I said, okay, I'll give it a go. That seems about right. You know, and it's adjusted from whatever a square inch. I don't know what it is. We have a spreadsheet for that again too. That's assistant work, so <laughs> I don't know the exact number, but like, yeah, you, let's say if it's three now, it started out at say a dollar. Not right. started. It started out me selling paintings for twenty five dollars, fifty dollars, a hundred dollars. Those were my prices back in the in the beginning of time. But and then how did they get there? It's like, well, you know, I've done well in the beginning. It was like, well, I'm selling them kind of as fast as I can make them. They should probably be higher, but I would usually ride that out for a couple months so I could stash a bunch of money in my bank account so I could have more time ahead. Basically, it's like the more money you got to back yourself up, the more you can, when you up your prices, if there's a lull, you can sit through it. You're not like getting desperate right away, mm -hmm. you know? And then basically it's like, well, X amount of shows. Then you start showing in a gallery with real recognition. You, all of a sudden you showed in five galleries with real recognition. You're live planning, painting at the Teleski and Snow event. You're getting asked to do murals like, okay, people really want this. I'm doing really well. The bank account's getting big. I guess I can adjust to what they want. Part of that is them in the, in the mix, like gallery saying your price is too low. It should be this. And you're like, okay, well, I've got this much save. This is what other artists I feel like I measure up to, you know, as well, like in terms of quality and in terms of exposure. So kind of rose to that level. And then you get to a point where you, you know, the more you're doing you, your credentials and as well as your expenses, you know, it takes a bigger studio to run this. It takes an assistant to run this show. All this is stuff you have to pay for. So what kind of math do you need to have to kind of make that all flow and, and be economical as well as travel, traveling for events, traveling for painting gigs, shows, lectures, demos, all that stuff. So, and that, that my pricing's been consistent. For, well, it stayed the same for like maybe last like three years or something. Mm -hmm. Kind of goes in jumps and clumps. It all depends what's going on. They're at a great price that I'm really happy to get. I feel like I can work as hard as I need to to get it done. I don't have to like rush anything. I feel like you, that's that's pure work. You know, what are you trying to? My my directive has always been to just make the freest, like freest in terms of I can work on it as long as it takes. But I know I'm not going. Okay, it looks good enough. I mean that that's not being the best artist you could be. So now now I'm at a point where I can just do that as well as. I don't know, gigs that I feel like I earned that. I mean, I guess that's the thing. Do you feel like you deserve what you're getting and why? 
you know, so I could feel strong about the pricing and clear about it. Well, I'm not in self question. I love, uh, I love that, you know, I asked you about pricing and you ended up talking about like the concept of self-worth and do you feel like you're getting treated well? Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I love that so much cause it's not like pricing is such a weird psychological trigger for everybody. Right. Mm -hmm. And what, it, it's not just artists either like software developers and product makers and crafters and everybody gets weird about pricing and at the end of the day, it's really all about, you know, are your prices such that they make sense compared to other similar products? And do you feel good about what you're getting paid for it? Yeah. I mean, that is really the bottom line. Otherwise you're making stuff up and then of course you're going to feel weird. Well, how are you, you know what I mean? It's like, cause everything could be like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's plenty of art that I think probably is like that, you know, not to dog it or be against it. I, whatever. I mean, it's it's objective. I mean, to the for, for the buyer's perspective and the artist's perspective, it's just like where are they going to meet and what do you want to do? And then that's like I think I see a lot of people. They're like, "Well, I see you work for this price all the time." It's like, "Well, is there a red dot on it?" Yeah, the price <laughs> you know, is the artist making a living? I don't know. I want to make a living. You know, some people don't have a job with their art and don't care what, if they have to sell it. You know, so. <laughs> Is there a red dot on it? That's going to be my new favorite question. I mean, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> so what was what was the day job you had before you went full-time as an artist? Uh, the last one I had, I was a mailman at a community college. Really? Delivering uh, professors and students and faculty. It was cool. It was like nice. You were kind of, you were pretty free. You walked around. You could walk around weird places. Nobody could really know if you were working or not. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, That's awesome. cool. I did that job for about seven years. Before that, I was an offset printer and the mailman and did video, did live sound. For a while, that was like my previous life was doing music and being in bands and doing those things. So I did a lot of time kind of jumping between two jobs and doing part-time band stuff and sound stuff. But, oh, right on. Yeah, I, um, uh, I did sound stuff when I was in high school and after high school okay. for a little while. Right yeah. Ran. Yeah, that's I, I, in the long, right? <laughs> I did. I did an outdoor concert for the Jets. Whoa. You remember the Jets? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that's crazy. I did a uh, Ziggy Marley. I did. Who's the Tally Me Banana guy? I did one for oh, him. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. There's a bunch wow. of metal bands and punk bands and other, but those were kind of like the high level Weezer back in the day. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, somebody asked what your inventory system was made out of. I know it was a custom solution, but do you know if it was used? It was if it used any particular software. Uh, it's uh, is it? Uh, it's in PHP. I mean, it's a custom notes mm -hmm. uh, inventory system, but it's built out of PHP. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. So I don't know if uh, how much you want to talk about this, but. And one of the things that came up when I was doing some research on you, uh, somebody mentioned that um, that you had some eye damage uh, mm -hmm. when you were younger, and and that that influenced the way that you make art. Is that is that a fair assessment? I would guess so. I mean, like pretty much my right eye, it's like I've got like no, I can see out of it if I close this eye, but mm -hmm. like thirty seconds, it goes blurry. It's like it's huh. strained to look. It's a lazy eye. I don't know. Like sometimes you'll notice it just drift off to the side. Who knows what it's looking at? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know when it's on or off. And then basically like my peripheral van uh, vision vision is like really small. That's why I'm doing this. Like basically I can't see my hands till they're like right in my face. Wow. So whatever that does, it does something. And definitely the other thing is this is like really light sensitive. So I'm always squinting in the sun. Mm -hmm. And if I close them, I can notice a total color difference. Like this, I, I'm guessing this eye sees normal. <laughs> this one, it's like you just jack the contrast on everything. So huh. I don't know exactly what that does to my work, but I just assume it does something. And like I tend to paint really close to my work when I'm having a session. And I, you know, I get back to see perspective and adjust composition, but I mean, my jump is so much greater that a lot of accidents happen, mm -hmm. things I don't expect in instance, instances of like, oh, that face looks great. And you step back and you're like, whoa, that is way out of whack. I kind of like it. 
So I don't know how that would differ since I only have my eyes. I can't like put yours on to see what it'd be, but <clears throat> that's what yeah. they're referring to. And I mean, even that's an interesting thing to bring up. It's like, I'll say this about that. It's not, I'm not saying it's good or bad, but that was an outsider art gallery. So what are they doing? They're finding some aspect of me that they can further market more so as this individual that they want to promote. Yeah, the like, outsider th art thing is really interesting, right? <laughs> it started as like people started calling artists outsider art because they were, I mean, they were essentially handicapped people, right? Mm -hmm. When when it started, and and it it was a way of labeling and defining the work. Mm -hmm. But outsider art now has become. I don't even know what it is anymore. Do, like, what what yeah. do you define as outsider art? I mean, I think even then, the the like, uh, whatever the defining factors, they seem to say like someone who's not worried about the gallery scene or those art group, someone like against that, who's like making work purposefully, like raw and aggressive. I mean, there's multiple definitions, but those are the ones I heard. So I did like connect to it. I thought when I when I started painting, it was like, I got a website. I'm just me, some crazy guy with a bunch of paintings and a website using eBay, selling stuff on the internet and eBay. And I don't care if a gallery finds me or not. Like, all I want to do is escape my job. That was my directive. And, you know, it's kind of funny because over time, you know, now I can say, oh, I showed in a hundred galleries. I've done all this stuff, but I still kind of feel like the outsider. Because even in the conversation, I mean, do you hear it when you're like, well, what do you do when there's a conflict with the gallery? It's like we either solve it or I walk away. Mm -hmm. well, that That's like a choice you're making. And it's like standing like, not I'm not like against it. If we're, if we're doing something good and we're connected, happy handshakes all the way, man, I got your back. I'm loyal to you. I'll, you know, let's, let's make this work. But otherwise, I mean, my, my, still my base objective is to remain free doing what I want, painting what I want, when I want, where I want and not getting like, okay, well, we have a hundred mile radius on you and we have a hundred mile radius on you and you can only show here, here, and here. And you know, this is what you need to do. We need more bunnies. Need more bunnies? What, what does that mean? <laughs> well, cause that's the other thing that happens. Oh, you know, like, cause you paint games too much control. Control. Like, more bunnies in your paintings. Yeah. We sold 20 bunnies. We need more bunnies. It's like, well, right. I was, it was Easter. I was excited. <laughs> <laughs> Or, you know, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing, what triggers an idea. So it's just kind of draw, drawing that line. But I feel like that's kind of outsidery in its own way. E either way, I don't know. Who knows? Everybody's, it's all just opinions and, and words. Just opinions and words. I mean, um, <laughs> <laughs> so you said that you like to get away to beaches. Do you have any favorite beaches in Oregon? Um, or anywhere? Yeah, you know, I, I like them all. I really like going to Ecola State Park, somewhere where there's like, serious woods next to the beach it's kind of like good for me i'm not like a too much sit in the middle of the beach with an umbrella guy i kind of like to be by the trees or go for a hike and then hit the beach and go back um it's cool it's pretty mellow there a lot of, not too many people over by task school because there's all that driftwood mass amounts and it always kind of changes i like that um uh where are all the whales wherever that is they got like that little lookout past lincoln city Whaler's Bay, maybe that's like part of it, but it's got another name. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not really that picky. I mean, those are places I go a lot. I go to Short Sands. That's pretty nice. Um, the state park up near Astoria, Fort Stevens. I like that. It's not really the beach, but I like all the wreckage. Well, there's a beach there too. That's actually really nice as well. But yeah, I spent a lot of time in Lincoln City and, and E. Cola. That's kind of like my go-tos. They're like two different things to me. They're extreme and what I get from them, the difference in them. I like walking around, looking at the driftwood, seeing how it looks like whales or animals or, you know, that's that. And then Nicole is about just getting in the woods. That that place is just like dinosaur forest to me. Just driving up there is enough, <laughs> almost, but not, you know what I'm saying? But I, if you've ever gone up there, just driving up, I mean, the level of trees and moss density and just going up and up and up. And up and up. Oh my God, look at it, it's a place here. Yeah. There's a dinosaur hiding. He's he's here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Oregon is like ridiculously beautiful. We're really lucky to live oh, out here. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the you've talked about your relationship with galleries, and you know you you didn't come from the art world. Like you didn't go to art school. Um, did you even go to college? Uh, I went to college for radio, TV, just okay. two year community college. Okay. Okay. So. So you're not like from that 
sort of academic background, uh, yeah. over the week, over the weekend of this workshop that I was teaching, we had a couple of artists who were, you know, BFA, MFA on that track. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and they really struggle with the idea of getting out and selling themselves. Mm -hmm. Why, why yeah. do you think, why do you think there's such a difference in that attitude between yeah. you and them? Because they've just created a ton of rules. I mean, I got a bunch of art school friends and it just seems like they just, I mean, I, we're talking, I've got no rules and I make weird rules for myself that I develop on accident that mm -hmm. are, aren't, those are bad accidents or whatever. Okay. Accidents maybe, but the, you know, there's just ideas. I mean, if I said to you, Hey, you could start selling your work on eBay and make a living. It just sounds so backwards. Doesn't it? Does it sound like it makes yeah, sense? It's definitely, it's there? definitely different from what they tell you in art school for sure. Yeah. Well, and it just seems like, well, who's buying your work? These aren't museums or collections or collectors or, you know, you're, you've got all these ideas. I mean, basically, I was the wild man. Somebody said that to me, like after I've been painting about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And they, they told me, here's my thing. Check me out. Gus Fink. Go search me on eBay. Look it up, dude. I've been making this much money. I've been, I haven't had a job since I was 18 years old. And you can check it out. I've been a power seller for this long. And I looked at it and I was like, well, this dude's making like two grand a month, 1,500, three grand, whatever. You're looking at it, you're like, that's survivable. Looking at his eBay. And I couldn't do it. He said, dude, what are you doing? Why aren't you doing it? You told me you can make 10 paintings a month. And you could quit right now. He's like a normal dude, like normal like me. We felt very similar into the same kind of music, aesthetic and stuff. And, and I was just like, it still took me like six months to start doing it. Why? Mm, now imagine if I went to school and somebody gave me all these ideas of what was right and wrong and what was prestigious and non-prestigious or wh whatever acceptable or what's going to damage your career. Well, I'm just going to stand in my way more, I would think, you know, I'm not saying they're wrong. Just, if that's what you want to do, it's like, what's your directive? You got to get real straight with what your real directive in life is. Is it to get in a museum or is it to pay your bills? And guess what? One probably leads to the other. <laughs> Once you get a hundred galleries, <laughs> Who knows what credential you've gained by being that madman or again maybe you did stand in your way and you're oversaturated and who, who knows but uh, i think i think that's just really it whatever you learn you're, you're learning it from someone who you're seen as authority who's your authority figure is going to be the next thing if you don't have one and you're making it up as you go you're creating some superhero that you could be whereas if you've listened to somebody who wrote a book who did this thing and they're they're wealthy and they succeeded you go, well, I want to be like them. Well, that you've made that your directive. And, you know, part of that's your power, maybe, and your knowledge. And then part of that might be in your own way. I don't know. Because it's like, you're, still not, you're never going to be the other person. I'm never going to be you. You're never going to be me. I'm never going to be, I mean, that's something I learned too. Like all my different buddies, we'd, we'd share information. Hey, you should try this. That buddy tries it, it doesn't work for him. I try what he tells me, it doesn't work for me because we have different interests, levels of excitement about this thing. It's like, I, I tried to do illustration for uh, like magazines and stuff. One job got totally irritated. I'm like, never doing this again. <laughs> Crazy. You know, where he's like, well, I'm supposed to call 10 people or I'm going to, you know what I mean? It's just, it's all what your skill set is as a person. And, and even beyond skill set, just your like wherewithal, wherewithal for something or, you know, how much you like it. So, yeah, I don't know if that really answers the question, but I just think, yeah, I don't, I don't know, whatever, watch out what you're reading or who you're believing and not even that they're a liar, just that, how does that pertain to you? You know, how does their life and lifestyle, because that's really what you're committing to as well. If I'm going to go in all high end galleries I, and, and deal with that community, you know what, I might want to take this off. I might want to fix this. I might want to have a different thing on, you know what I'm saying? I can try and be as, I, I, I mean, I'm pretty articulate. I can talk. I'm very social. I want to talk to people, but like, I still know I go into certain places and I'm still getting looked at as like the wild man or like, oh, that's fun. I'm kind of at the circus, but I don't need this art. I've had that experience. Not, not even knocking the people. It was just a bad fit that I chased, you know? Mm -hmm. It would have yeah, been better if I wasn't there, probably. It would probably have been better if I wasn't there and there was just a statement with no picture. Interesting. What, what, is that, what do you mean by that? Well, if you just saw my work and you didn't see me, you don't know who I am. You make up a story of who I am. Mm -hmm. So maybe you made an old guy with a nice long gray beard or no clean shaven and 
you know what I'm saying? Sometimes the identity, like, I feel like I fit 90% of everything I'm doing. I mean, it's, I don't try to fit it or not fit it. I try to be myself in the work, in my career and in myself. But, you know, if you're, if you're going into like some high end clients, they might be like, who's this kid? I mean, people were calling me a kid till I was till about a year ago, till there was like a little gray in here. Uh, I had to be 33 to not be a kid. It's like, was I a kid when I was 35? I don't know. <laughs> but I looked like one. So I was getting de- definitely that stood in my way on certain things. And that that drove me. Actually, it's a great example of what you're saying. And that drove me to seek out a different type of gallery. And I got more like engaged in the lowbrow scene because it was cool to be a skateboarder. It was cool to have tattoos in that scene. That didn't stand in your way. That just that was just a high five where in the fine art world, you're supposed to be some other kind of individual whether they want to believe, say that or not like yeah you are and you're supposed to use different words my words might be a little simple for that sometimes or at the time anyway yeah yeah i think that's super interesting definitely there's an element in the fine art world of if they want to take you know an outsider artist or or an artist who doesn't come from that educational background and elevate them to the, these big these big galleries and museums, they will sand off the edges of the artist and try to make the artist look, um, try to make the artist more palatable, right? Yeah, and even if they don't, even if they're not going to, and some don't, they're doing that mindfully. They're choosing the wild cat and going, we got a wild cat, check this out. Yeah, you know, that's what they do with right? It's just, just marketing and it's just, just an acknowledgement between school and non-school and even talking to school people. Again, this isn't a knock or saying better or worse. It's just they talk different. They use different words. They got different articulations. All stuff they learned in school, which I, I can I can say probably open certain doors for them and closes certain ones for me. Because they have a different, you know, and in my opinion, but again, it's just an opinion, an excessive uh like how do I want to say it? Basically, they're like looking up to them in a hierarchy way. Where I'm going, you get in a conversation with me, and you're a gallery. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. You're, you're asking me a bunch of questions. What have I done? What, why, why, why should you show me? I'm gonna say, well, who are your collectors? What average price do you sell it for? Galleries get offended. Like, well, who the hell are you to ask me? It's like, well, I'm the other fifty percent of your money. <laughs> you're half the team, and I'm half the team. So I want to know what your half of the team is gonna do for me. When was the last time you had a write up in a in a magazine? Do you get national attention? Do you promote yourself nationally? Do you, what do you do for advertising? You know, and I, art school, like I could just say that to my friends, like, what the hell are you doing? You can't do that. I was like, no, you can't do that. I can, (laughs) you know, but again, I'm not saying my way is the right way. It's just, what are you doing? What are you trying to do? I want to make sure that they're at the same level because and sometimes you know you don't have to ask the question you're like oh i've seen this gallery in 10 magazines well there's no question right mm-hmm. if it's some gallery i've never heard of well you know not everybody's heard of me not everybody's heard of you some people have some you know it all depends who you ask kind of deal so yeah galleries get shocked when artists know how to talk about business yeah totally totally yeah most don't and most just don't have experience they're just happy to get in or ready to jump through a fire hoop to do it yeah. I really love the fact that you come from this, the background that you do and, and you've been in 50 galleries and then all the artists who would die to get into a gallery can't get in. I just find that super, super interesting. And maybe they could, you know, if they were bothering people and you don't bother somebody once. I mean, that's actually worth noting that we didn't bring up. It's like to get even my first show at a hair salon, <laughs> I, I went in there seven times. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, the person's not here today. Or wait, oh, this is pretty cool. They'll probably like it. Okay, they're not here today to see it. Oh, they're not here today to see it. Oh, they saw it. Oh, well, let's make a plan. Come back next week. Come back next week. I mean, the first giant mural I did, I was supposed to have scaffolding and paint, and I was supposed to do it this time. I went, oh, has it been two weeks already? Oh, come back in a week. Oh, come back in a week. Oh, you know what, dude? You can start this week, but I don't have scaffolding or paint. I went and bought a bunch of paint. He said he had two ladders, so I got up on the ladder and I used a roller. You know, you got to want to go do it. I mean, I could say that I could go, like, took so many examples where it's just like, if you really want something, you just keep going. You got to keep plugging away. You know, even my giant show in LA, it was like, I got in a group show with them, got another group show with them, kept a solo show, no response to my email. 
no response, 10 emails, no response. And I thought, well, how did they find me in the first place? They saw a giant mural I did. My friend was like, hey, dude, I know this is kind of crazy. You said you wanted to do another mural, but uh, Holocene's offering $50 and all the beer you can drink to paint their smoking room. <laughs> <50 bucks. laughs> I'm not even an alcoholic. I have like five beers. <laughs> but, you know, that I, the next email I sent was new mural, blah, 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 blah. I sent the measurements. How about that solo show? I got a response that night. Dude, nice. let's do it. That's killer. I'm not saying that works every time, but it's like, think about what it is. What stands out? What's going to make you stand out? If it's not your education and your skilled background, well, then you better have some other kind of proof in your pudding, you know? You better be easy to work with. You better be a hustler. You better have some great work or do something that's like that you don't see all your friends doing. At that time, it was doing a 20 by 60 foot mural. That was in 2004 when you didn't see people doing that. You know, now it doesn't stand out that much. Now people use some cherry pickers and scaffolding and getting paid and using projectors. It was like I was just making a mess on the wall for four days. People were going to like beat me up for making a mess on the wall. That's awesome. Well, Jesse Reno, thank you so much for for taking the time to talk with me here today, man. And we're running out of time. But if if somebody wanted to follow up with you and learn more about who you are and stuff, where should they go? Uh, they can go to my website, just jessereno.com, J S S E R E N O. Um, that's great. Or on Instagram, it's Jesse Reno, just at Jesse Reno. You can see what I'm doing almost every day. I'm on there sometimes, multiple times a day. That's probably my most active spot, but yeah, email is the best one through my website. I answer, I'm on that like a hawk. Cool. Or my studio in Portland. It's on 30th and Burnside, 3022 East Burnside. So anytime I'm working on there, or you can make an appointment either way. An appointment doesn't mean something official. It means shoot me an email and say, I'd like to come over there and drive the 10 minutes over <laughs> and spend too much time saying too many things. Just be ready for lots of painting. <laughs> Cool, man. Thanks so much. I, I really appreciate you taking the time. Awesome. Likewise, man. Thanks for having me on your show. All right. Have a great day. Cheers.